Um, well, KCOM, Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine here in North Central or Northeast Missouri, depends on who you talk to. Uh, Kirksville itself is a town of about 17,000. And actually, AT still back in the mid uh, 1800s moved here and, and basically developed osteopathic medicine in this part of the country. Um, <clears throat> he started out as a, um, his father was a preacher. They traveled the country quite a bit. And in those days, preachers were also medicine men. They also brought health care with them. And so um, Dr. Still, Jr., um, settled in this part of the country and began to perform. He, was a, he is a medical doctor, was a medical doctor, and um, really was dissatisfied with a lot of the treatment methods that were out there. So basically developed osteopathy through um, observing and studying. He studied a lot of anatomy, a lot of physiology, that kind of thing and um, basically started uh, osteopathic practice here in Kirksville back in around 1874-ish. So the first school here was built in 1892, and um, it is sitting right downstairs from where I'm sitting. It's, it's, it's restored in our little foyer right next to the museum. Uh, but anyway, the, um, it started out as the American School of Osteopathy, and basically the, the, uh, what they're doing is it's what we what we basically really try to take home is that it is a whole patient health care. We look at the patient as a whole and not as just one arm or one leg. The sum is um, much more than the, the the whole is much more some much more than the sum of its parts essentially. So we're looking at the whole patient in our diagnosis and our treatment, uh, et cetera. So uh, that's that's one of the big things that's that basically osteopathy really excels at. Um, and um, so as far as the school goes, we have been here since 1892 and um, have gone through some changes. Like I said, it started out as American School of Osteopathy, went through Kirksville Surgery and then, and then uh, Kirksville School of Osteopathic Medicine and has basically grown since. So uh, right now, our, our little neck of the woods has grown into A.T. Still University with campuses both here in Kirksville and in Mesa, Arizona. So... We also have an osteopathic school in Arizona as well. Okay. Great. So to catch up. Awesome. And and just uh, to simplify things, the school in Arizona, that is a totally separate application, correct? Correct. For it people. is. Okay. Yep. Totally okay. separate. We're getting more and more uh, schools that are dividing with, with extra campuses and it's kind of confusing. Is it still one application or is it a totally different application? Yeah. Yeah. And more and more schools are doing that, but ours is totally separate and re reviewed separately the whole bit. Okay. Where do you see, uh, KCOM in the grand scheme of things, obviously the first osteopathic school mm -hmm. being the first, doesn't always mean the best. So you've been around for so long. How are you keeping up with changing technologies? And obviously, you've already said you've restored some of the old building. Uh, how are you guys keeping up with that changing technology? <laughs> Good question. Being in admissions, I'm not very involved with the curriculum itself. Um, but from what I know, and my limited scope is that uh, the, the curriculum is, that's one thing I really admire about AT Still and KCOM is their adaptability to change. So what they're doing is their curriculum has gone from the basic two and two type of old, old medical school curriculums where you'd have two years of, of class and two years of lecture and lab and then, and then go into two years rotation to implementing much more clinical experiences in the first two years. So the, the students are now getting much more hands-on, which is is in tune with the types of students that we're getting. I mean, we the, 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 the educators, the administration, the deans, et cetera, have studied, uh, have looked at the kinds of students we're getting, uh, and they learn better in groups. They learn better in experiential type learning, and that's what they're trying to, what they've started implementing into the curriculum. So the, the clinical experiences are much sooner um, in the first year, and then they, they, you know, there's more in the second year, and then, of course, the third year, fourth year rotations. Um, but... That's where I see in the future is that more and more um, KCOM is really trying to adapt to what medical education is becoming in in more much more hands on and like I said group group learning um, type of scenarios instead of just the typical you know, sit an organic chem lecture and, and digest a 
a, a test kind of thing. So it's much more active in their in their learning process. So the the change is what I really really come to admire about this school in particular. Okay, that's good. I don't know if that sets it aside from any other school. I'm not trying to yeah. say that's going to make it the best, but I think that's you know I uh, I think that's one thing that I that I see that KCOM is trying to do to to keep up with technology and keep up with um, educational processes. Okay. So we have a uh, we did a, an iPad initiative for the KCOM students this year. We're doing kind of a research experiment on that uh, trial basis to see how that works. All of the students, instead of carrying uh, backpacks and tons of books, they now have uh, an iPad that they use and, and can download uh, their lectures, um, et cetera. They take most of their tests on computers. Uh, we do diagnostic ultrasound, uh, things like radiology. We have an MRI here on campus. So I think you know we're in that in that regard in the tech in the medical technology realm we're we're keeping up with it as well. That's great. That question, yeah. How are the students adapting to the iPad? You know what I th I think they like it because they come from that era. So yeah, I know there know. was just a I think some research published a couple of weeks ago showing one of the med schools I think in California scored twenty three percent higher on their. Um, I think they're USMLE score uh, boards. Oh. So, wow! Year over year, when the after the introduction of the iPad. Oh, that's a good. I would like to see that report. My dean would love that. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll forward it to you if I find it. Cool. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about the types of students that you get there. Can can you? I know it's hard to kind of generalize a specific student, but what type of student are you looking for? Um, <clears throat> well, the. You mentioned the old old pre meds, and we do we do get a, our, a, a good amount of non traditional students. But what we're really looking for are those students that really have a heart to practice medicine. Um, what I mean by that is that medicine is a lot of dedicated hard work, as you well know. Um, and we're really we're not we're we're looking for students that can that can you know accelerate academically, but also really want to serve people. And have a compassion to serve people. So, um, our mission statement says that as part of it is that we're trying to serve the underserved populations. We're trying to get physicians in areas of need. So, I think we're looking for people that are that are doing that, particularly in the Kirksville area or the Missouri area. There's a lot of medically underserved areas around this part of the state, around this part of the region. So, we're really looking for for people that are that are willing to go back and serve in that in that arena. So. Uh, it's, it's a it's a challenge sometimes, but uh, we we think we're we're doing pretty well. Yeah. How does the, I want to talk about how obviously you're in admissions, correct? So you're screening all the applicants, correct? Your office is. How does if we can talk a little more generally? How does a student that's applying to KCOM? show that to you that they have that passion for medicine? What are you seeing in their personal statement? What are you seeing in their extracurriculars? Great, great question. So just to give you a little background, the, um, the GPA and the MCAT, of course, are, are good starting parameters for us, um, but also life experiences and extracurricular activities, such as uh, experience with patient-to-patient -patient contact, like um, shadowing is a good one. That's, that's uh, that's a challenge for students to do anymore um, with HIPAA violations and HIPAA requirements and things like that. But um, <clears throat> any kind of patient to patient or any kind of clinical contact that they can get. Uh, and as important is extracurricular activity in the form of, say, volunteerism or some sort of work outside of class that's really trying to help the broader community. Um, and not for, and we, Believe me, we can tell when it's for the application's sake. So we can, you know, we want that student that's really going to be there. That's that's made that part of their lifestyle essentially. So, um, you know, you don't have to have thousands of of hours in a clinical, or I mean, excuse me, in a volunteer environment or anything like that. But some way to portray in your personal statement and your activities that that is part of your lifestyle and in, in giving to others. And that's what I think the biggest way to show that. If if I can expand just a little bit about what you just mentioned about how you can see that it's for the application, and I, I've talked about this before, <laughs> showing showing commitment and and quality is better than quantity. If, if that's what you're saying, 
Inse- exactly ins- instead of seeing 10, 10 different volunteer experiences that are one or two hours a piece, you'd rather see a couple that are several hours that, that span some time and you can build relationships with people and absolutely ma- yep. make, uh, make a, a, an eff- have an effect on whatever you're doing. Right. Yeah, okay. exactly. And that also shows commitment to a certain degree as well. You yeah. Bet. Okay. That shows much better on the application. Okay. Uh, you, you'd mentioned some shadowing and shadowing is, seems to be a hot topic, which you just mentioned. It's kind of getting harder and harder. I think, um, Einstein just published a good article about shadowing and the challenges for the med student or the pre-med student actually being put in a situation mm-hmm. where they are introduced as a student doctor and kind of they feel like they're forced upon the the patient and so that that's kind of a hot topic right now but for for osteopathic schools for for you for KCOM are do you want to see a student shadowing an osteopathic physician is that a requirement for you guys it is not a requirement it is not um nor is shadowing an osteopathic physician because in some areas of the country it's much more difficult to do that in others just because of sheer numbers so no it is not a requirement at all um, we do want them, however, to understand to a certain degree what, what osteopathy is, what they're getting into. So that's the big, that's the reason we wanted to see shadowing in, in general, regardless, is we want them to see what medicine's about, what they're getting into. And osteopathy, to a certain degree, at least they've researched it, maybe not shadow it, but uh, research so they understand what they're, what they're getting into. Because the four years are going to go to school and the, maybe possibly the residencies that they're doing is a major commitment. So they have to understand it in order to, in order to, to live it for four years, so, so, so to speak. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Makes sense. Good. What Good. you had mentioned uh, briefly, GPA and MCAT are obviously, I think for, for 99.9% of schools <laughs> out there, the, the major yeah. um, kind of filters for an application. What were your averages uh, last year, if you know them? <laughs> Uh, we are right at, a, gosh, you know what? I can look them up real quick, but we're right at the mid um, B plus level, like a three, four average in, in our science and cumulative GPAs. Okay. And our MCAT average is a 27. Okay. And how many students? So stu- it's a little less than most medical schools. Okay. How many, how many students do you guys have there? Uh, each class enters 172 students each year. Wow. And how many do you typically interview for those? Generally, we interview right around 450 to 500 students a year. Wow. Yeah. So that's out, that's out of our 4,000, what do we have? 4,000, almost 100 applications this year. Okay. So a little more than 10% uh, interview rate and then cut right. that down. Okay. So competitive. Yeah. Competitive. It's, yes, it's very, very. I want to talk competition. Looking right. around on the internet, studentdoctor.net. Uh, net, uh, is seems to be the go-to resource for most pre-med students, and I would warn them <laughs> not, yeah, okay. not to go the there. And, yeah. and yesterday, I highlighted a couple a, a couple um, different threads on the website, and I'll link to them in the show notes. But and but the general the general uh, statement out there, the the general consensus is your grades aren't good enough for an MD. Go to a DO school. What do you what what do you feel when you hear that? Um, uh, a little disappointment actually, because the the curriculum is the same, so it's not any easier than any med schools out there. Um, but uh, I I do feel a little disappointment, and I I even interviewed a kid the the other day that iterated to that. He said, "Well, my my dad, who was a physician, said your grades aren't good enough. Try a DO school." And of course, guess what I didn't do. <laughs> Except him, <laughs> but anyway, I <won't> there. <laughs> but um, uh, it's a little disappointing because it's you know it's not a standard of quality of, of education by any means. Um, one is is fit just as fit as the other. I think osteopathic schools are possibly a little bit more forgiving than than the med schools, and I can't I'm, you know I, I'm not commenting on med schools. I don't I don't live in that world, so um, I'm not saying one thing or another about that. 
Um, but that's just, you know, rumor has it, so to speak. Yeah. So, well, yeah, it's, you it's guys, a little disappointing. You guys have the grade replacement, which the um, allopathic, the AMCAS application doesn't have. So that's that might be where you're saying you're a little more forgiving. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yep. But yeah, our, our, uh, go ahead. Sorry. I, I was just going to say, you, you kind of briefly talked, you, you mentioned that it is the same curriculum. Mm-hmm. Uh, osteopathic schools obviously have OMT. Correct. So the, the osteopathic students like to go, well, we actually learn more than you guys in the same amount of time. So <laughs> they brag a little bit more. So it's it's it always seems to be this back and forth. Yeah. And now... I don't know how familiar you are with the residency side of things, but now they're combining the credentialing process for residencies. Yep, 2015. So at, at some point, what's the, what's the point of having two separate degrees? Um, good question. It's, it's, it'll boil down to the, the way you want to approach a patient and the way you treat, the way you feel you can treat a patient. So um, I think that's what it's going to boil down to. Okay. So I, yeah, I think that's bottom line is what it'll boil down to. Okay. So for the for the pre med student out there, looking at his the the opportunities of what schools are out there, he's obviously got the list of uh, is it 130 or so MD schools, and then 36 or 37 now DO schools. Right. What would you say to that student to to have them lean towards a, a DO school to as a primary application and not get that feedback that goes, oh, your grades aren't good enough, go to a DO? You know, what, what I advise the students every time. I said, you're going to get a good education no matter where you go. Um, you're going to get a good. Uh, you're going to become a good doctor uh, as long as you have the compassion for it. It's a. It's a really every school is a personality fit. Uh, it's it's really the, the it, it's becomes the duty of the student to, or the applicant to go out and see which school is best for them, which school will match their personality the best. So, you know, we can't, as the KCUM would never say that, you know, um, KCUMB over here is a better, is a better or worse education. No, it's not. You're going to come out with the same degree, the same abilities. Um, but it's just what, what better fits your match, what better fits your personality. So, um, really, you know, what it's going to be, what, what the student wants, you know, we're going to bring this to the table and the student's going to bring their desires to the table and hopefully they match. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, I think. Yeah, it does. And and I I agree with you. I think, uh, I've heard a lot of kind of anecdotal stories of students that have their, have their rank list of schools Sure. and they get an interview at their top school and they go and they, they can't, they hate it. They hate it. Yep. Um, and so there, there is a lot more than, to a school than a name. There is a lot more to a school than their average GPA, their average MCAT, their their match list results, um, yep. the environment, the the faculty, uh, the facilities. Every school has the personality, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Good. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. Um. Can you talk a little bit about? personal statements. I know it's really not KCOM specific, but in a broader sense, in a, in a broader sense, uh, I think a lot of students get hung up on the personal statement. Okay. I think okay. there's, there's always that sense of, uh, I don't want to talk about the cliches of, Oh, I was in the hospital and that's why I want to be a doctor. Oh, my mom or dad were, was sick. That's why I want to be a doctor. Right. But right. for, for some people, that really is the truth. And so yeah. they, it, they, they struggle with what to say, how to say it. Can, can you maybe give us a couple things, or the listeners, a couple things, um, maybe some, some of the best things you've, you've heard in a personal statement? And then on the flip side after that, maybe some, some things to absolutely avoid saying. <laughs> yes, I can give you those first, but no. <laughs> Um, the best, the best things I've heard say in a, in a statement is, uh, that whatever experience the student had, um, it was like an aha moment or it, it, it influenced them in some way very deeply. So it's, 
it's not that, you know, I'm, I'm going to med school because my dad was, in fact, that's, that's pretty much it. Or my mother was, that's kind of a, a real flag to us. But anyway, um, um, the, the best thing they can say in their personal statement is something from the heart. And that's what we always tell people. We, we've read, we read literally thousands of personal statements each year. And every one of our reviewers can get to the point where they can start understanding and, and reading into which ones are written from an honest perspective, an honest heartfelt perspective, as far as how they feel and their mainly their motivation to become a doctor, to become a physician. So um, that's where you really, it's gotta be a heartfelt and, and you're, you're exactly right. Not because, well, <clears throat> I went to the doctor and he set my arm and it was really a great experience kind of thing. That's, um, but if they have, if they have an experience or they just, even through their, 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 whether it be they're working in a hospital, anything like that, that the experience that they had really touched them deeply and, and they feel it from the heart. That's, that's what the personal statement can, should reflect. If, and then we say that the personal statement should, you know, why do you want to be in medicine, who you are basically, and um, what, what, do you, what you want to be essentially in the future, not a physician, but like what you want to do with that. That's kind of what the personal statement should reflect. And so what, who you are is some experiences that you've had or just, you know, telling it a little bit about yourself and then why you want to make be in medicine and then what you want to do with that. Those are the best characteristics of what you want to have in a personal statement. Okay. So um, some good ones, you know, I've had, I've read hundreds and thousands, not hundreds of thousands, but thousands of them, quite a few of them that, um, you know, they've had a very deep experience with a family member in the hospital or somebody they were very close to, or even uh, somebody that was working in a hospital, even through an experience or even a clinic, I guess, uh, an experience that they had where, you know, they, went through some level of adversity and they came out of it in a positive fashion. So we're finding the students that really have the passion and I can't explain why, but really have the motivation or the passion have been through some sort of adverse experience. Um, that's not to say that everybody that's lived a great life can't or hasn't, but, um, but that's really when they come out and explain that from a heartfelt point of view, that that, that adverse experience really helped them. Um, that that comes across a lot more as a heartfelt and compassionate type of motivation for medicine. Uh, in your personal statement, that's what I want to do it in your own words. Uh, don't copy and paste from a website. We can tell those two. We've read the websites. Um, do it in your own words and be honest about it. And quotes in our, some people say quotes are good, but in our, in our recollection, specifically co quotes, are not good because they're not your thoughts. They're not the, the applicant's thoughts. They're somebody else's. So we want, you have a short amount of space. You have a limited time, a space that you can reflect. So do it in your, in your context, not somebody else's. Um, don't, let's see, don't quote from Harry Potter movies. Um, I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't recommend that. <laughs> we had, we had that. That is a true story. We what, had, what about quote, Star Wars? Um, <laughs> one specific, one specific personal statement started off with, hey, raise your hands up, get up out of your chair. And I'm reading this, I'm going, what? And then it said, okay, now you're awake and you'll pay attention to my personal statement. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> so it's, it's the little things that make a big difference. <laughs> so again, heartfelt and, and uh, pat, you know, honest is the, best, is the best advice we can give for a personal statement. Okay. So. And... Some of the absolutely do not do, besides quoting from Harry Potter. <laughs> um, some of the absolutes do not do is, <sighs> let's see, there's so many. But <laughs> what do you see the most of? What do we see the most of is, um, People that don't that that want to get into medicine for the prestige rather than for the what the job does. How does and, how does that come across? Okay, good question. Because they're in their in their say what they want to do when they when they graduate is um, they're mentioning things like well I I you know they're mentioning things outside of medicine. I want to live in this town. I want to do this. 
you know, does that make sense? I mean, not that they're not going to be able to do that. They're going to be able to do that, but we have to have, you know, let's, let's go from the base and then earn that while you're in medicine. But, so, um, so they talk about playing golf every day and driving yes. nice cars and want to go to a dermatology resident because it's much less stress than, than an ER resident. You know, those, those types of things we don't, we don't want to do. If you have a dermatologist, you want to be a dermatologist. Great. We love you and do it because you absolutely love and want to help people with skin disease. You know, that's, <laughs> but the, the worst thing you can do is say, well, I'm just, I'd rather have, I can raise a family with this type of schedule and, and not that they're wrong. I'm just saying that's probably not a good thing to do during the personal statement or the interview for that matter. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, that's surprising that, that you see that a lot. Yeah. Um, okay. People need to hopefully get a little more advice, uh, when they're writing their personal statements then. Um, Hopefully that. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe that is what's coming from the heart, though. So now there's a conflict. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. There is no right or wrong. There really, really isn't. So yeah. um, somebody may have a passion, a, a total a honest passion that they want to live in Beverly Hills and, and uh, you know, work eight to eight to three every day. I don't know. So. Yeah. Okay. But. Can you um, just speak briefly uh, <laughs> about the importance of getting your application in on time. Oh gosh. Yes. Um, I'll try to be brief, but you don't have to be brief. <laughs> uh, the, there's a, there's a couple different reasons. The biggest reason is, um, you are going to be in front of an, an admissions committee. And I think this is true for most med schools, not just ours, but you're going to be in front of an admissions committee. That's fairly hungry at the beginning of the application cycle. At the end of the application cycle, they've already seen, you know, each one of the interviewers probably seen 150, 100 to 200 applications. Um, they they now are getting a little weary, maybe, but um, but the, at the end of the application cycle, the admissions committee committees become much more picky because they have a a, a bulk of students that they're choosing from, even by you know December or November. So. To apply early gives you a better shot at being in that initial pool of, of, of people where the admissions committees are hungry for good candidates. So I would say some people disagree, but I, in my observation, admissions committees aren't quite as, um, I don't want to say choosy, but they're, they're, they are, they're still going to be very selective, but they're, they're, they're much more open-minded about it at the beginning of the application cycle than towards the end. Um, and again, towards the end of the application cycle, you, your class is filling up. <clears throat> there are less and less spaces to be um, opened up or dealt out for the students. And uh, especially in a lot of medical schools that, that apply or that close their application dates early, you are going to run out of slots pretty, pretty quickly because it is extremely competitive. So there's like 50 to 1 seats that, you know, applications per seat with our school or 40, something like that. But uh, so there's, it's very, very competitive, and it just gives you that little bit of edge if you do apply early. Okay. So the the term rolling admissions, you guys, you guys have rolling admissions there where you're constantly filling those seats. So I, I used the analogy recently of it, it's it's like a game of musical chairs. The, f- yes, the further exactly. along you go, the the less seats, and, and you're likely going to not end up with a seat and be kicked out of the game. Yep, that's a great analogy, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, great. I think, uh, I think if, if you have like one parting, uh, piece of wisdom for a, a high school student out there, we, we get a, a lot of emails from high school students. If, okay. if you could tell the high school student one thing that he or she should be doing when they're entering undergrad to kind of get them set in the right direction towards, Getting mm-hmm. getting a, an acceptance letter from KCOM. Okay. Um, well, first of all, the advice I would want them to do is make sure that's what they want to do, and how you do that is get involved in. There's there's many many opportunities in healthcare, especially that you can volunteer, that you can work in to really get to the trenches. You can you between high school and college, you can uh, take some courses to become, say, a CNA or a medical technology, whatever the case may be or just work in a doctor's office or volunteer in a hospital, something of that nature. 
get involved and make sure that's what you want to do. Med school is a heavy duty commitment. The rewards are just as great as the commitment in medicine, in my mind, um, and in many, obviously, people hear them, their mind. Uh, so the rewards are there, the benefits are there, but the road to there is very, very bumpy. So make sure it's what you want to do. Make sure you know exactly how to do it. Um, if you're a senior in high school, we, did, we talked to a lot of high school students. Contact the admissions department in a med school. They will be happy to help you. If they don't, call me. Um, I'll make sure they do. But, <laughs> um, but we, you know, we love that opportunity that people are so, if they're dedicated from the beginning, they want to know what they're getting into. And we're, from a med school's perspective, we're able to tell them, okay, this is what you want to look at in undergrad. Most colleges have a pre-health advisor that they get in, that they can get in with, a pre-health club that they can get in with, and all of these are going to help them understand what what medicine is about, and especially what med school is about. So get involved, apply early, apply often, as we say, and uh, <clears throat> and you know ask a lot of questions.